This is a polyethylene plastic film. We find it wrapped around fruits and vegetables of the grocery market, and it has many other uses. It seems quite flimsy, but it is really quite strong. And it will hold air or helium. Because it is both light and strong, this familiar material has helped transform the ancient balloon into a modern scientific research vehicle capable of exploration at the space frontier. In the Horizons of Science film program, we want to meet some of the men and women in science today, to see and hear them at work, and to try to share their experience and their points of view. Today, we're going to learn about plastic balloon systems and meet a man who has devoted a lifetime to balloon research. For the past 10 years, he has worked on space research projects for the U.S. Air Force, the Navy, and various American universities. His name is Otto C. Winsen. Otto Winsen is an engineer, a designer, and a scientist. Most of all, of course, he is an explorer, a man in search of new and broader horizons. Today, mankind embarks on its most exciting adventure, the conquest of space. But before man can go into space, many kinds of essential information and experience are needed. And the role of the balloon in getting this kind of information has been very important. Balloons were man's first aerial vehicle, his first way of leaving the ground, and they have always fascinated those close to them. When I was a boy in Cologne in the 1930s, I saw the Zeppelin floating majestically overhead. It was then I caught the fever of flight, and it has never left me. No matter how much you become involved, you will find that balloons and everything about balloons is fascinating. We begin our work before dawn so that we can launch the balloon by sunrise when there is little or no wind. First, we lay out the entire length of the balloon on a protective ground cloth because the delicate plastic film has to be handled with extreme care. At this moment, our balloon is a 300 foot long plastic envelope. The upper part of the balloon is carefully threaded through the arms of the launching platform. Before inflation, it is necessary to compute the lift of the balloon. We will need enough gas to lift the balloon and all the equipment it carries, plus a little more, to make it rise at the proper speed. The balloon is laid out and we attach the red and white open parachute and then the various scientific and control instruments. Each balloon system has its own radio transmitter and timing and radio control devices to separate the scientific load from the balloon and bring it down safely by parachute at the conclusion of the flight. It's getting close to sunrise now and everything is in place. Now we begin the actual work of inflating the balloon. We connect the red inflation tube to the helium gas hose. The helium passing through the tube into the balloon inflates a bubble in the top of the balloon. And then the balloon comes to life. The balloon is held securely to the ground until it contains enough helium to give the entire system its initial lift. And lift is the upward force of the helium gas. And we must know its temperature and pressure to determine its volume and therefore its lift. Our luck is holding. It's the kind of beautiful calm morning that a balloonist dreams about. The center of attention for this flight is an instrument called a refractometer, which will be sent aloft to record and transmit to us on the ground information about the refractive index of the atmosphere. Scientists want to find out how various layers in the atmosphere affect the path of microwaves, such as radar. Our balloon is now inflated and ready to go, and we must get her off before the wind comes up. If wind should catch her, while she is held captive on the ground, our balloon acts like a huge sail and can be torn to pieces. 
Once airborne, she'll be able to withstand the forces of tremendous wind currents. Launching a balloon calls for precision and teamwork. When we're set to launch, there's a final alert to the crew. Once the balloon is launched, it cannot be held back. Perfect timing is necessary to keep everybody out of harm's way as the instruments are snatched up to the sky. Once our balloon is airborne, we know she has left the Earth irrevocably. And when she's on her way, we all feel, we've done everything we can for you. Now you're on your own. The balloon ascends at about the same speed as an express elevator, about 1,200 to 1,400 feet a minute. The helium at the top of the balloon will continue to expand as the balloon rises. And at its ceiling altitude of over 100,000 feet for this flight, it will completely fill the balloon with some gas to spare, and this excess gas is spilled out. At that point, the balloon then reaches equilibrium, begins to float and execute a level flight. The balloon was man's first means for leaving the ground, and for a long time it excited the imagination of dreamers and explorers. The first balloons were built of paper, by the Montgolfier brothers in 1783. The first aerial passengers were animals. And the first humans to fly in balloons were two daring French noblemen in Paris. Later balloons were made of coated fabric in a series of experimental balloon flights with sealed cabins in the 1930s, Professor Auguste Picard in Europe reached 52,000 feet. The world's altitude record of over 72,000 feet was achieved in 1935 in the United States by Captains Stevens and Anderson. For over 10 years after, balloon development for high altitude research was at a standstill. We searched for and finally found material that would enable us to fly balloons to higher altitudes. The plastic material polyethylene gave us the means. It weighed one-sixth of previous balloon fabrics. We started from scratch. There was no prior experience for us to draw on in this field. Sometimes it was harder to get the balloons load down and to get it aloft. The parachute often picked awkward landing places, and our work during the sub-zero Minnesota winters earned us the title of balloonatics. As the balloon program developed, we learned how to fabricate much larger balloons, up to several million cubic feet capacity. And as we grew more experienced in our operational techniques, we started testing balloon systems with very heavy loads and we had to cope with complicated launching problems, which sometimes resulted in spectacular failures. But in research and development, we sometimes learn much more from failure than from success. By this time, we had advanced to the point where under Navy and Air Force sponsorship, the plastic balloon became a reliable research vehicle. We could now give scientists the unique opportunity to probe the upper reaches of the atmosphere with a large variety of scientific equipment. A single balloon would carry a multitude of experiments from many different scientific groups. For three years, for an Air Force aeromedical research program, our balloons carried animals and living tissues to the top of the atmosphere to expose them to the bombardment of powerful radiation coming from outer space. After these flights, scientists noticed that some of the mice had developed color changes in their fur as a result of the impact of cosmic radiation. We were now prepared for the exciting next step, to carry man to the edge of space in a sealed cabin. We wanted a minimum weight space capsule which could be used for repeated scientific flights by one individual 
a combination pilot and scientific observer. But before we could fly the man, we had to make many test flights to make sure the pilot would be safe in any emergency. We installed cameras on a full-scale model capsule to bring back answers to vital questions. How would the capsule parachute function above 100,000 feet? Could the capsule shell be jettisoned so the pilot could escape? We could leave nothing to chance. We had to make tests under every single possible emergency condition. Major David G. Simons, a flight surgeon for the Air Force Aeromedical Field Laboratory, demonstrated our confidence that a man could be taken to the threshold of space and brought back safely. Dr. Simons was the pilot and human guinea pig who would establish for the first time that a man could be put up in a balloon to 100,000 foot altitude and stay there for a day and a night in a sealed cabin in a space equivalent environment and could carry out scientific assignments as a first step toward manned spaceflight. The space cabin was a Terella, a miniature Earth designed to protect the human body from the hostile space environment. The vehicle was a giant three million cubic foot balloon, towering almost 400 feet from the bottom of the open pit iron mine at Crosby, Minnesota, a launch site we selected to protect the balloon. Manhai was a milestone in plastic balloon development and was a stepping stone to man's conquest of space. As Simons ascended at a thousand feet a minute, he reported his sensations and checked off the data indicated by the instruments to our command post on the ground. You see the little pilot balloon yet, Dave? It must be below you, and perhaps you're looking against the cloud, so it may not show up too well, but it's directly opposite the sun from you, and a little perhaps to the right. Uh... I haven't seen it yet, I'll keep an eye open for it. Through a split mirror mounted outside the capsule, he could look at the balloon and the earth below at the same time. Major Simon's 32-hour flight was crowded with physiological and psychological experiments. It was important to find out his reactions to cosmic radiation, how much stress a man could take and how efficiently he could function isolated in an artificial environment. He made valuable observations for geophysicists, meteorologists, and astronomers. He could see 400 miles in each direction and could watch entire weather systems developing below him. Dr. Simons saw a strange sky purple dark overhead and the earth below reflecting light. This Manhai flight established a pioneer bridgehead above 99% of the earth's atmosphere. And so you see that the balloon, which had already been retired to the scrap heap decades ago, has emerged as a vital research vehicle. The plastic balloon, original to the United States, is an important weapon in our attack on space. The Manhai capsule you saw before is a minimum capsule in order to take one man to as high an altitude as possible. Lightweight, smallest possible size, a space laboratory in which the pilot alone serves many functions. Another important stage in our work has been the development of the two-man capsule for the U.S. Navy. We call this Stratolab, an astrophysical observatory on which a telescope can be used high above the interference of the Earth's atmosphere. This will give scientists the opportunity to visually explore the universe. From here, we will go on to the next phase, which we call Project Satellorp. Satellorp Jr., in a two-man system, 
which has the capability of being oriented in space in order to carry on astronomical and geophysical observations. One man can rest while the other man is at work. The final system will be a true space laboratory in which a crew of five, six, or seven scientists, pilot, and other observers will carry out specialized functions under the watchful eye of a space physiologist. This very flexible laboratory can serve many, many purposes. Here is a model which shows and demonstrates the concept in more detail. The landing gear built into the capsule serves to orient the gondola on landing to prevent damage to the system. The capsule can be rotated by an electromechanical system so that observations can be carried out with much greater facility. It is possible, for instance, to depressurize one end or to drop an end shell in order to eject the pilot. A man would be able to leave Saddle Orp in his spacesuit. Such escape will be necessary for space travelers to learn how to survive and work outside their protective capsule. This kind of freedom will be essential in order to make repairs and to assemble space platforms in the future. Here is the means of testing the components, the equipment, the spaceship itself before we put man in space on a rocket so that all of the phenomena which are associated with the hostile space environment can be given a thorough checkout and man can become familiar with the dangers that lurk everywhere in space. Man is at the threshold of his attempt to invade space, to fly to the moon and the stars. The development of the balloon capsule system is giving us an opportunity to prepare for this task.